Thank you. And you guys can all hear me? Yes. OK, so I'm not mic'd just because I prefer just speaking. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. I know it's a class, so you have to be here. But thank you for your professor, uh, Professor Bui, for inviting me and for Global Studies for helping me just arrange this. And I live just down the street, so it wasn't complicated. Um, but I am on sabbatical, which means I'm kind of checked out, haven't been in front of students for a while, so it is really nice to be back. Um, and I'm looking around. I teach one cross-listed class with Global Studies, but I don't know if I recognize faces in here. I don't know. But you probably, even if you have, haven't heard me talk about this 10-year-in-the-making book. Um, so I knew that it would be students I'm talking to. And so I was told to keep the talk to like 40, 45 minutes to leave time for questions. So I'll do just that. Um, and I also thought that because it would be talking with students, and I knew you would read part of the book or some of the book, um, so I also wanted to give a kind of both a discussion of the book and a little bit of a behind the scenes, how I wrote it and conducted my research part of the talk. Um, and I like doing that because sometimes people don't quite realize kind of the ethical commitments or the kind of the author's leanings as they're writing the book. And so I thought that might be kind of an interesting peek as to how you put a book together. Um, and so as far as how I've structured the talk, it kind of bounces back and forth between the substance of the book and how I was thinking as I was writing the book. So first, I cover two preliminary matters, which kind of give us the foundation for what I'm talking about. Then I'll say a bit about my methods and positionality. And so if you did make it all the way through the book, that was hidden in the appendix. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll get into the meat of the book, which is the argument. Um, I'll give you a sample of one of the chapters, which maybe or maybe you didn't get to, and then how and why I arrived at that argument. Um, and then lastly, I'll end with just a short, uh, short note on how I see this as a hopeful book, despite the fact that I'm usually quite pessimistic about everything. <laughs> so we'll go from there. Um, as far as the two preliminary matters, so I do not like the cover of my book. It is like this kind of yellowed, antiquated map that like includes some of the countries I talk about, but not all of them, includes some other ones. Um, this was the second version of a cover that my publisher presented me with. The first version of the cover was this weird pen and ink um, depiction of a plantation scene, and it had sort of like a historical font. And both my editor and I were like, no way. So this is what we ended up with. Um, on this side is, so Professor Darian Smith, maybe you guys know her, right? So she was a is still a great mentor to me. And so when I was submitting the manuscript to my book, like the completed manuscript, I'd worked on it forever, she's like, put a mock-up cover on there. She's like, pick something bright and flashy, like a good photograph, you know, kind of pretend like the book is all but completed, all they need to do is publish it. So this was my mock-up cover, which I almost like a little bit better, honestly. Um, it's a picture from my field work, and it's a picture of the inside of the Caribbean Court of Justice, which is what I wrote my book about. This is where they held their video hearings, and it shows the flags of Trinidad and Tobago on the left, Barbados. Then in the second to the right is the Caribbean community flag. That's their economic community. I'll say a little bit more about. And then the Caribbean Court of Justice flag. And I was like, OK, this, this sort of captures the region, right? So we had these covers floating out there. The publisher had also asked me to look at Caribbean artwork. And so I looked for hours at Caribbean artwork to try to find something that captured the region. But the point of all of this is not just that I'm dissatisfied with this one, but that it's really hard. The editor and the publisher struggled to kind of put their finger on what a region is. I struggled to put my finger on what a region is. And even the, court, the Caribbean Court of Justice really struggles to kind of how you depict a region, right? So this question of what is a region is very live and present in, in many of the things we do. Um, and the problem with this, of course, is that we're so familiar with how you depict a nation state, right? And so a nation state really is kind of the long way of saying what we usually call a country, right? So we know how you depict a country, and everybody finds that easily recognizable. Like, what country is this? United States, right? What country is this? Mexico, right? We know flags. We know maps. What country is this? 
France, right? So we even know these landmarks. So it's really easy for us to reflect and to accept and to immediately recognize nation states. A region? Much more difficult, right? And so that is really at the very, very core of this book is like, what is a region? How do you represent it? And how does a court of law participate in making it when it's really hard to know what it is in the beginning? Um, so about this court, right? Oh, this is, this is the way that the CCJ tries to depict a region, for example. Um, so on the cover <clears throat> of a couple of their annual reports, as one of the court administrators told me, they tried very hard to pick out faces that captured the whole region, right? So they did it not by maps, not by flags, but by trying to pick out people's faces that looked like people in their region. So again, even the court kind of struggles to, to figure out how you represent a region, especially to the public that it's supposed to be representing. Um, tricky. And so that is, like I said, very much what the court is trying to do in their work of making a region. Okay, so now we're on preliminary matter number two, which is this Caribbean Court of Justice. Um, so this Caribbean Court of Justice is located in Trinidad and Tobago, right at the very end, at the very bottom of this Caribbean chain of islands. Um, when I conducted the majority of my research there in 2012, 2013, it was still a relatively new court. It was just established and opened in 2005. Um, this court is a regional court, and it's kind of a funky one because it has two purposes that seem slightly at odds with each other. This is a chart from my book, um, maybe not self-explanatory, but basically this court was created for two reasons. The first one, is its original jurisdiction. So all of the member states of the Caribbean community belong to the court's original jurisdiction. So the Caribbean community, like I mentioned, is an economic integration um, region. So a lot like the um, European Union, a group of Caribbean islands decided to come together through treaties and agreements to create trade deals and employment deals with each other. And they needed a court that could help um, arbitrate any disputes that arose for those treaties and agreements. So under that jurisdiction, the court has 12 member states. But the court was also established to solve another problem. And that's most of these member states are former British colonies. They are currently independent, but despite their independence, they continue to appeal their cases to the Privy Council, which is located in London, right? So in the United States, we have a Supreme Court that we appeal our cases all the way up to. Most of the Caribbean, they appeal their cases all the way back to London, their former colonizer. Kind of a weird scenario, and so people who are creating the Caribbean Court of Justice were like, well, we could use this court to solve that problem. People can replace the Privy Council with the Caribbean Court of Justice. And that was the court's appellate jurisdiction. So what's kind of weird about this is that in its original jurisdiction, it's supposed to kind of beef up the regional agreement and the regional feeling of, this, of the Caribbean. And it's in appellate jurisdiction, it's supposed to shore up the independence of these nation states. So you have kind of two different goals that are at odds. And so going into the court to conduct my research, these were the things swirling around in my head. Like, how does this court, where they have these states that really want to be independent, how is it also participating in this project of region making? What does it mean to create a region when nobody really recognizes what the heck that is? The court itself doesn't really have an idea of what, of what the region is. And so how is it, how is it doing this? Um, Another point you might be able to see in the middle here, the court had a real hard time and continues to convincing states to actually leave the Privy Council and join its appellate jurisdiction. So very few states to this day have actually joined its appellate jurisdiction. Most of them continue to appeal to the Privy Council. That's kind of another story and another piece to the puzzle. I don't touch on that too much today, but I can certainly answer questions. <clears throat> okay. So we know that I'm studying this Caribbean Court of Justice in Trinidad and Tobago, and as an anthropologist by training and a lawyer by training, I went and I lived in Trinidad and Tobago for about 15 months. Um, like I said, I was a lawyer by training, and so that allowed me the possibility of acting as an intern at the court 
And so when I was conducting my research, which I used very traditional anthropological um, methods, so participant observation meant that I was participating and observing the Caribbean Court of Justice. And so in my role as an intern, I had my desk <laughs> at the court. Um, I did legal research. I wrote speeches for the judges. Um, I did participated in tours. I participated in their public education program. Um, so I did as much as I could for the court, and that allowed me fairly unfettered access. So I could go anywhere, see anything, talk to anybody in the court that I wanted to. Um, I also had more formal interviews that I conducted, in total around probably 60. Um, so that was with people who worked at the court, all of the judges, um, academics around the region, lawyers around the region, judges around the region, um, and just regular everyday people that were living in Trinidad and Tobago. I did a whole bevy of document analysis, everything from their annual reports to brochures to judicial decisions and everything in between. Um, courtroom observation is part of my job as an intern. I was required to attend all of the court hearings, and so that made it really easy for me. And so sometimes I would pay more attention to the courtroom arguments and legal arguments that were going on, and sometimes I'd pay more attention to the sort of the pomp, the pomp and circumstance of uh, courtroom activity. And you see both of those kind of reflected in the book. Um, I also did archival research in Trinidad, and then because it was a former British, British colony, <clears throat> I went to London and did a lot of research there. And for those archival research, um, projects that I was doing, I was really looking into how and why um, this area of the world decided to stay with the Privy Council for so long and how and why some of these states eventually joined um, the CCJ. And lastly, since I was living in Trinidad, wanted to get involved, I really missed my dog, um, I decided to volunteer in Trinidad and Tobago and so uh, weekly I worked at the um, local SPCA, the animal shelter, and I also joined things like a professional women's dinner club, and so I really got to know the culture of Trinidad and Tobago, got to know what people thought about regionalism, what they thought about the CCJ, and just got the temperature of the region as far as what region making looked like from kind of the public perspective. <clears throat> um, like I said, most of my research took place in 2012, 2013, but then I did do some follow-up research in 2018 and 2019. So the research was spread over a good, a good portion of time. Um, so access to the court. I say a bit about this also in the appendix, because um, how does somebody, I was a graduate student at the time, how does somebody like me waltz into Trinidad and Tobago and have unfettered access to the highest court, right? One is careful pilot research. This is like very typical for setting up an ethnographic project. You don't just waltz in there. You set it up carefully. So I utilized networks that my professors helped open doors for me. Um, I spent about six weeks in both Trinidad and Barbados meeting relevant people, relevant judges, and especially spending time at the CCJ. So I went online, scheduled a tour online for the CCJ, and used that as sort of the first door that opened for me. And through that, I met, I talk about um, Justice Matthews, that's a pseudonym, but I talked to Justice Matthews, kind of got him on board with the project, and he helped pave the way for me to speak with the president of the court. Um, so the president of the court was the only person who would be able to offer me permission to do my research. And so I wrote up a proposal, presented it to the president, organized with him how I would be an intern and donate legal services. Um, and then we drew up a contract, which I signed. There are certain things he didn't want me to talk about, but they were mostly like the, the staff squabbles that would happen. But everything else he was going to allow me to look at and write about. Um, those are kind of the standard things that people will mention when they talk about permission. But I really wanted to draw attention to my positionality, right? I think this played a key role in me getting permission and access, and I think it often plays a key role, often unmentioned role, in how other people get access to field sites. So for me, positionality is sort of who I am, where I come from, how I'm seen in a different part of the world, and I think all of this made a huge difference. So for me, specifically, I'm an educated North American anthropologist with a legal background, right? At the CCJ, that positionality 
was largely viewed as somebody who could benefit them, right? It was useful for them to have somebody from my position write something about them, and they were very welcome to invite that into their courthouse. It also happened that President Obama was president when I was doing research. So this is a mostly black Caribbean part of the world, and having a black president created quite warm feelings towards the United States at that point in time. Things would be different now, I guarantee it. It also helped that I am what Trinidadians call all mixed up. So, <laughs> right, I am half Filipino, half white, and that is all mixed up, and that is a very recognizable quality in Trinidad. Um, so people could look at me, and sometimes I could kind of pass as Trinidadian until I started talking, right? That was helpful. Even more important than that, people could look at me and see what some of my Trini friends called the international passport, whiter skin. So I had this fluidity because I was all mixed up and where I was recognizably kind of Trinidadian looking, but also white enough to give me, unfortunately, the privileges that come with whiteness, right? Very important. Not only that, but I was cisgender female, really unthreatening. So all of these things added together, I think were incredibly important and gave me a tremendous amount of recognizable privilege to get where I was at the CCJ. And not only did I know this, but the people around me recognized this too. And if you made it to the appendix, you would have heard the story I told about the president of the CCJ. Um, I was at a party at his house, and this party was being hosted in honor of visiting guests from the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda. And the president was introducing me to this guest and he was telling him a little bit about me and who I was. And then the president, the president of the court, Caribbean Court of Justice, with this visiting guest from the ICTR, was like, you know what pisses me off about her? And I was like, oh my god. And he was like, it's that it took some student from the United States to come down here to study our court and tell us something. And he's like, why couldn't a Caribbean student tell us that? And I was like, uh, I'm like, well, there's reasons why somebody from the outside might see something new. And I'm like, I'm sure a Caribbean student can come to the United States and do similar research. And as soon as I said that, like the three of us standing there were like, no, no. Like it, it, it would never have been possible, right? No Caribbean student could waltz into the Supreme Court of the United States and get some sort of access at all, much like the type of access I had. And so the president of the CCJ was not the only one who brought this up. This was a very highly educated, worldly crowd that I was working with. And so a number of people brought up to me, like, who are you to come down here to tell us about ourselves, right? These sorts of interactions I had stayed with me as I conducted my research, as I wrote the book, as I formulated my arguments, because as I wrote in the book, they really forced me to acknowledge the racial, social, and historical dynamics of the research I was conducting, right? So I never forgot that I was in this privileged position and had a responsibility and a role. Um, I was gonna do my job as a social scientist, but I was going to do it ethically. Okay, so the argument of the book. <clears throat> so we have a little bit of information about the context that we're in, right? This is a world that is really dominated by the nation state. Um, everybody, like we already talked about, everybody already recognizes what the nation state is, kind of knows what it is, um, and it, so it leaves this open question as to what is the region. So we have this context where the region is largely undefined and unrecognizable. Not only that, but along with this expectation that the nation state is the thing you want to be, is also this expectation that you want to be a sovereign nation state, right? So the sovereign nation state is supposed to be the end all be all objective in this world that we live in. Um, there's a lot of critical theorists that talk about what sovereignty is and what the sovereign nation state is. And to really summarize, what I see as this sovereign nation state. Um, I call it the unified, and it's, it's, a, it's an entity where the unified and uniform people live within a clearly bounded territory under an exclusive jurisdictional authority. Right, so that's supposed to be what you're striving for as a polity, not a region, but a sovereign nation state. Um, 
We also know that the Caribbean, along with much of the world, was colonized for hundreds of years. And currently, when I was doing my research, and even now, um, like much of the post-colonial world, they're still held to the standards and expectations that were created by the colonizers. So the expectation that you're a sovereign nation state is something they are bearing on their shoulders, right? So they're kind of struggling under that because the thing called the sovereign nation state seems never to be quite attainable and never quite to be serving their needs the best it can. Um, not only that, but we live in this world that's structured by colonialism, um, wherein these globally northern states tend to rest comfortably at the top of the global hierarchy, and globally southern states tend to always be kicked to the bottom. So they are working in this context, this Caribbean Court of Justice, which really um, leads to this question of, they're, they're tasked with creating a region in this context, and so what does it do? How does it carry out this task? And not only that, but when it's doing its work, what are the implications on sovereignty? So these were more of the guiding questions of the research I was conducting. And so when it comes to the argument I make, it is, is it addressing both of these two questions? So how does it constitute a region in this tricky context? Well, I argue that the CCJ takes this thing called the sovereign nation state and doesn't consider it to be an aspiration or an objective, but looks at it more like it's a toolkit that it can kind of piece apart, like how have other nation states gone, gone around or gone through the process of building themselves? What techniques and tools are they using? And so the CCJ mines the sovereign nation state for useful techniques and tools. But it doesn't merely copy them. Instead, it adapts them, it cites them, right? And what I mean by cite, like if you cite a reference in your paper, you, you point to it, right? You're like, oh, what I'm writing is sort of similar to what they're writing. But when you're pointing, you're actually creating a necessary difference. So simultaneously, it's the same and different. And so when the CCJ is adopting these tools and techniques, it's citing them. It's showing that they're the same but different. And in their sameness, they're hoping to gain some sort of legitimacy, like, oh, look, we're kind of like the nation state. But in the difference, they're saying, but actually, we're going to be a region. So they're doing this kind of very tricky, what we would call indexical or citational work. But what's the, what's the implication on sovereignty when they're doing that? Well, the CCJ is pretty clear. Justice Matthews, I think I put in the intro or the first chapter, is pretty clear that they really don't want to blindly follow the structures that have been put in place for them. They're not going to blindly accept sovereignty as the end all be all. Instead, they are very consciously seeking something different, and that's something that I call the non-sovereign region. Um, and it does this, as I just said, by doing this indexical work, by, by taking things associated with the sovereign nation state, reworking them in a way that creates something different. So instead of, for example, adopting wholeheartedly the legal practices of the North Atlantic, they do something a little different. Um, and this is what I cover in the book. So you've seen the table of contents. So in chapters two through six, I look at specific classic tools of sovereign nation state making. And then I show how the CCJ has used those tools in a slightly different citational way. Um, for me, I think the chapter that might illustrate this work the best is chapter five, which is talking about a language. Um, and so I'll go into that. I'm just going to, I think I'm good. OK. I'm, I don't know exactly my timing here. Um, <clears throat> so the, a language is, using language is really a very standard, classic way that many people have written about um, as far as nation and state building. So the first half of chapter five is really talking about how the CCJ does this, how it uses language to build something that actually seems like it's veering towards the nation state model. So the best example I offer is how the CCJ uses a standardized language. So it uses English. All of its publications are in English. All of its court hearings are in English. The court itself officially has three official languages. The people that are members of the court 
amongst the like kind of indigenous populations, there's probably hundreds of languages, but the court only ever uses English. And this is classic nation state building material. Um, most countries or states have an official language and they insist that people speak it. And that's one way that they can kind of erase difference between people and pretend that they're that unified group of people. Um, the court does that. But then in the second half of the chapter, I discuss how they also use language in a way that really kind of twists and turns sovereignty on its head. Um, you're not meant to read this totally, so don't worry about that. Um, I'll talk about it. But in the second half of the chapter, I discuss something on how the court has decided to address its judges by the term, your honor, rather than the very British term, my lord. So the Privy Council calls its judges my lord, British courts call their judges my lord, but the CCJ says, no, we're gonna call our judges your honor. Um, and in its very first annual report, this is the relevant page, the court explains why they're gonna call their judges your honor. In creating a new institution, the annual report states, decisions must be made on seemingly simple issues such as how are the judges to be addressed. In making each decision, the CCJ understood itself as creating traditions, and each tradition must be created with thought and consideration for the future of the institution and what it means to the development of the Caribbean region. So when the annual report later tells us exactly what the CCJ judges will be called, it's clear that this decision was made with the Caribbean region and the development of the Caribbean legal tradition, this is the passage also tells us this, with that in mind. And this is what the annual report says. So this is the quote up there. We are not lords over serfs. We are honorable men and women of the Caribbean, working for our Caribbean. We bow in unison to the Caribbean people whom we serve. Now, in this one poetic sentence, the court announces to its audience not only how its judges should be addressed, as your honor, but also how it seeks to fundamentally transform the relationship between law and society in the Anglophone Caribbean. So specifically, the CCJ claims that it will tip the historically and quintessentially British feudal experience of law on its head. Instead of British judges lording over their Caribbean subjects, a Caribbean court will now serve a Caribbean people humbly and honorably. So instead of justice coming from the outside, and being imposed from above, it was now of a Caribbean people and for the Caribbean people. So by selecting your honor rather than my lord, the CCJ is in fact distinguishing itself from the Privy Council, it's, it's kind of competitor, right? But even more profoundly than this, it is shifting the relationship between law, the court, the region, and society. So as much as the court has jurisdiction over its people, it's permitting these people to have some sort of jurisdiction over it. And as much as the CCJ is going to speak the law, it's allowing these people to also have this opportunity. So this whole question of who gets to speak the law is important because it has ramifications on this question of sovereignty. So Justin Richland, have any of you had class with Justin? So he's a professor in our anthropology department, and he's written a lot about this. He's a legal anthropologist as well. Um, so he has argued that jurisdiction, or the speaking of the law, um, is a means through which law itself can kind of rein in its own power, right? So it's a means through which the scope of law's power and authority are announced and delimited in the everyday details of legal discourse. So in proclaiming their jurisdiction over a case, or even when it denies its jurisdiction over a particular case, that is whenever a court speaks the law, a court presupposes, entails, and limits its legal authority. So in this way, it is in this way that jurisdiction speaks sovereignty into existence, right? So speaking the law is necessarily creating the bounds of that law and is creating kind of the scope of a, of, of a of authority, the scope of sovereignty. So what happens then when the CCJ shares its jurisdictional authority with regular people? This would mean that it's inviting others, just these regular people, into the project of delimiting law's power, 
And this is what unsettles traditional, uh, uh, traditional sovereignty as it's conceived by kind of the global north. And I suggest that the court is doing this knowingly and purposefully as a response to the region's experience living under the lording tendencies of the British, right? It wants to do something different and it's not going to just copy what the Brits are doing in having one sovereign power. Okay, we know that the term your honor is important and holds all sorts of importance to the CCJ. So what's really weird is that when the attorneys make mistakes, as they constantly do in court and constantly call the judges, my lord, the judges never correct them. They never ever once corrected them, right? And so I offer one example and I suggest that there's some significance in this. Some 10 months into my research, I, like the others at the court, still eagerly anticipated the courtroom proceedings. These were, after all, somewhat of a rarity. Adding to the excitement, the matter scheduled for this particular day was bound to be very interesting. It was a high stakes, complex matter that was part of a series of appeals coming from Belize. Already present in the courtroom when I arrived were a handful of attorneys representing both sides of the case. There were three from England and three from Belize. So British counsel were not regularly appearing before the CCJ, but this was certainly not the first time, especially in this particular case. They always silks and solicitors kind of coming into town every once in a while for this particular appeal. Um, these same hearings and appeals also established a familiarity between all the attorneys. And when I walked into the courtroom, they're already casually chatting with each other. Um, the most senior attorney from Britain Mr. Goldsmith, I call him, was especially chatty, and he was asking his Belizean opposing counsel, who I call Mr. Errol, about the nationalities of each of the judges, and importantly, what he was supposed to call them. Justice or your honor was the succinct and correct response offered by Mr. Errol. Justice or your honor, however, was not what Mr. Goldsmith called the judges throughout much of the hearing. Mr. Errol, too, sometimes got it wrong. Within the first five minutes of the appeal, Mr. Goldsmith was already calling the presiding judge, my lord. And this was just the beginning. Throughout the day's arguments, he could not get it right. Regularly and sometimes for long periods of time, he exclusively called the judges, my lords. Mr. Errol, for his part, was far more careful with his words, but it took nearly an hour before he too eventually stumbled, addressing a judge as my lord, your honor. So it was not quite my lord, but certainly not cleanly, Your Honor, and he had managed to introduce a new term of address, a rendition of which I had heard before and after in different hearings, appeals, and cases uttered by attorneys from Belize, Barbados, Britain, and beyond. So the verbal missteps of both Mr. Goldsmith and Mr. Errol were extremely commonplace at the CCJ, with attorneys from all backgrounds periodically lapsing between My Lord, Your Honor, and the hybrid My Lord, Your Honor. Yet there was not one occasion, as I said, not one occasion during the full expanse of my research that anyone ever corrected the attorneys who got it wrong. The judges never flinched, winced, or corrected them, and the registry staff who are charged with managing the courtroom never took the opportunity presented by a break in the arguments to, to officially announce, quietly inform, or even offhandedly mention that the CCJ policy was to address judges as your honor. So just when the judges might be expected to, quote, give instructions, sharp instructions to subordinate the mind, voice, and body to authority, as has been seen in Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and the United States as courts, the CCJ judges refrain to do so in their own regional court. And while there certainly may be reasonable reasons or pragmatic reasons for this new court to permit some latitude on a seemingly trivial issue, I suggest that there's something else happening. To be sure, the judges were clearly aware of the attorney's violations. When I discussed this with them during a visit to the court in 2019, or 2018, the judges all rolled their eyes and laughed and kind of told their own stories of how often they'd heard this happen. And so when the room finally settled, I added that what I found especially interesting was that they never actually enforced their decision to call the judge your honor. And as I said this, I could see the look of disbelief and creeping in some of their faces. And so I hedged a little, a little bit and was like, oh, at least that's what happened when I was there. Um, and the judges all looked around at each other murmuring, oh, could that be true? Until the president of the court spoke up authoritatively. No, 
he said definitively, we never correct it. And so several of the judges appeared taken aback, and there were whispers suggesting that perhaps they should start to correct the attorneys, but ultimately the president's certainty on the matter ended the discussion, and it seemed also to serve as a directive for the future. The, judge, the judges shall not, going forward, correct the attorneys. So what's going on here? Why would they not correct the attorneys? I argue that just as the court says in its annual report, these judges are deliberately, maybe unconsciously, refraining from lording over their subjects. They allow their subjects to speak for themselves. The court does not demand subservience, but is there to serve. And it's within this logic that the judges do not speak the law in this particular instance. They're not, they do not state an exception, they do not exercise absolute power, and they do not speak the sovereignty of the region into existence. Though far less intentional than some of their other linguistic decisions, the court's abstention from language becomes an important technique in the rejection of sovereignty and the pursuit of a non-sovereign region. So the CCJ ultimately refuses to require others to use language in precisely the same way it does, because to do so would, to under, would be to undermine the court's broader project. So to say this otherwise, the court relies on language to set itself apart from the lording tendencies of the Privy Council and the strictures of sovereign statehood. If it were to exercise its authoritative legal voice in such a direct manner over such a seemingly trivial issue, like how you're supposed to address the judges, the CCJ would make itself into the very lords exercising the same domineering authority it abhors. Instead, it allows the attorneys to speak unobstructed and uncorrected. So what the attorney's misspeaks announced, amount to, what this my lord your honor amounts to, is the necessary oppositional force that saves the court from the sovereignty making tendencies of language and law. Instead, the CCJ, instead of the CCJ unilaterally determining what the court, the region, and the law will be, things like my lord and my lord your honor constitute the dialectic or the oppositional force that does not totally derail the regional po project, but actually makes that regional project possible. So for whatever is created through these absence of the law's speech, just when you think law should speak and correct the attorneys, whatever's created with that and the presence of the attorney's voices is something that is decidedly non-sovereign. So it's hard to listen to somebody read. So what I hope you gathered from that is that, I'm just gonna summarize that quickly, what I hope you gathered from that is the court is using language both to build something like a region, much like a state would do, but it's doing it in this careful way so that it does not copy exactly the blueprint of the nation state. It's tweaking it so that it creates something non-sovereign. Um, the rest of the book in the different chapters builds on that argument and elaborates that argument by talking about the different techniques and tools of nation state making. Okay, that's the big argument. That was my one example. How and why I arrived at some of the arguments I'm making. Um, the way that I put this book together and started thinking about kind of my theoretical interventions draw on things like all of the literature and theories that I have read, what I actually observed in the field and what kind of data I collected, and then importantly, as I mentioned, how I saw my role and responsibility as a North American social scientist. So some of these kind of, I don't know what to call them, commitments or theoretical interventions developed in this way. So the first one, for example, there is a ton of post-colonial literature out there that talks about mimicry. Right? It talks about how post-colonial states and post-colonial peoples try to mimic their colonizers in a variety of ways for a variety of reasons and often end up producing some Frankenstein carnivalesque version of the original. And you can almost hear people laughing under these critiques. Right? They're slightly poking fun of how things have ended up. Um, that's not what I saw, right? That is not what I saw in the field. These were judges wholeheartedly devoted to this project of region making, very consciously and deliberately not trying to copy or mimic what has happened, 
but understanding that they needed to do something that was recognizable so they wouldn't be dismissed right off the bat. Right? So they were really struggling with what existed out there and how could they could move or maneuver themselves around this. Um, and that is why I could not find myself buying into this mimicry argument that is widespread in postcolonial studies. Um, why I felt that citationality, which is what I got from linguistic anthropology, seemed to explain much more accurately what I was actually observing in the field. Similarly, with the second point, lots of writing out there, critical theorists writing out there about sovereignty. A lot of these theorists and a lot of anthropologists and ethnographers have noticed that sovereignty doesn't quite work for everybody. So they do things like tweak sovereignty and have different names for different types of sovereignty, but they never seem to step outside of sovereignty entirely. I um, mean, again, what I observed in the field is these group, this group of people at the court recognized that sovereignty wasn't really working for these small Caribbean states. Um, and so they were wrestling again with how to get out of this kind of expectation of sovereignty. And that's when I started reading a new body of literature, specifically, it's a lot of Caribbean-ness, people studying the Caribbean, talking about all the different non-sovereign creations that are kind of happening and swirling around the Caribbean. Um, and that, again, seemed to be much more accurately depicting what this court was doing and how I started to think of the region not as a super state, not as a sovereign super state, but as something quite different, a non-sovereign region. Um, when it comes to points three and four, this is much more where my, my role and responsibility stepped in and how I was going to write about and talk about the CCJ. Um, Specifically, I didn't think that I would be doing my job and I would not be doing justice to the CCJ if I just portrayed this as some rosy picture of everything going smoothly and that there was some premeditated plan, because there wasn't. There was a lot of trial and error. There were a lot of mistakes made. Um, there were a lot of kind of just bad decisions. And so what I thought I needed to do in my job was really to show how the court tried things out, learned from them. Um, in particular, there was the, I don't know if anybody read the example of like, I think it was in the last chapter, branding, about how they were selling this, these pieces of jewelry in their gift shop. And they're kind of like overpriced, not very attractive pieces of CCJ jewelry. And that was just going nowhere, right? And so as a branding technique, they needed to fix that. And so when I came back to the court in 2018 or 2019, all of a sudden that jewelry had disappeared. And now they were, instead of selling it for this overpriced amount, they were giving it away as gifts in like kind of very nicely packaged gift boxes. And just learning how a gift might be treasured and valued more than kind of the, the kind of garishness of selling CCJ jewelry in a gift shop really, I think, exhibits the kind of learning curve and the, the thoughtfulness that the court was approaching this region building project with. <coughs> Lastly, this idea that this is a, the region as a possibility. So everybody in the Caribbean that I talked to was so eager to hear me say whether I thought the CCJ was going to fail or succeed. They're like, you know about it. Is this just a huge waste of money? Is this just going to fail? Is this just a dog with no all bark and no bite? Everybody wanted me to take a position. And I feel, and I, I felt then and I feel now, that it is not my role to decide if this is going to be a failure or a success. And in fact, I think it, you could never actually say that. So I wanted to show that this was a story of possibility, right? This was an invitation to think about how the world might be organized differently, how the nation state maybe isn't the only answer, maybe isn't the right answer, and how this court is introducing this possibility. Um, OK, one last quick slide. Right, so this idea of possibility really leads me into this notion that I was, like I said, I'm kind of a pessimist at heart, and so I was really, really desiring somehow to make this a hopeful story. And so where I got that hope from was really talking to the CCJ judges, because it was often kind of a, um, it, it was an uphill battle for them at all points in time because everybody wanted to see them fail, but they remained optimistic. And I was like, how are they remaining optimistic? And it really was this recognition from them that sure, they haven't totally succeeded, but they certainly haven't failed, right? That they knew this was going to be an 
ongoing process. And in fact, many people out there have written about state building and states as an ongoing statement. And so to think about the region as an ongoing performance, an ongoing making of the region, and it's nothing ever more than that. Um, and the, the judges found hope in that, and I think there is in fact hope with that, that you can never just accept that this is a, a, a finished product, that it's always a region in the making. Um, I will end there. Um, this, that was the sitting bench when I was there. It has changed dramatically since then. But thank you. Happy to answer questions. <laughs> yeah, <anyway. laughs>